Hello and welcome to the Observatory Science Centre. Mars has long fascinated people. Even ancient civilizations could look out upon the night skies and they would see Mercury and Venus hugging close to the sun, moving very quickly around it. They could look into the depths of sky at midnight and see Jupiter and Saturn moving slowly and majestically through the night skies. But Mars, Mars moved quicker and it was a very vibrant and noticeable red colour and it would move obviously and quickly from one constellation of the zodiac to the next. When ancient civilizations looked for something to represent the god of war, Mars was their obvious choice. When H.G. Wells was writing in the War of the Worlds and wanted a home for this alien invaded species, Mars was our obvious choice. When every B-movie wanted an alien to attack us, Mars was where they came from. That fascination has remained throughout the centuries. Even in the 19th century, as science started to tackle it, that fascination was there. Percival Lovell, in the 19th century, used telescopes, much like this one, to study Mars. And at the eyepiece of this telescope, he would draw, draw maps of Mars. And his imagination could see lines, and his imagination populated the surface of the Mars with an ancient civilization building vast canals to carry water from its poles across a dying and drying planet to feed the people. And into the 20th century, and even in the 20th century, that fascination remains. In the mid-20th century, people such as Patrick Moore, for example, would still talk about life on Mars, almost as though it was a certainty. But then in 1969, Mariner 4 travels to Mars and it is able to send us the first photographs. And it shows that the surface of Mars is in fact a cratered and blasted surface, more akin to the moon than the Earth. And with those photographs, any imaginations, any dreams of life upon Mars evaporated just like the waters upon Mars from Lovell's canals. Let's compare the Earth and Mars. This is our home, the Earth. Our globe, about 13,000 kilometers across. Our globe surrounded by the thinnest of layers of air and water. A thin layer that is all that separates life upon the Earth from the freezing, dead, desolate regions of space. And this is Mars. It's about half the size of the Earth, and over 6,000 kilometers across. It's about half the gravity. Unable to hold on to its water because that gravity is so low. Unable to hold on to that air. So unlike the Earth, with its thin protective layer of atmosphere, Mars has lost that air, and the waters have boiled away into space. So. While Mars and Earth are very similar in some ways, Mars is indeed the most Earth-like planet. Mars has frozen and dried. Life on Mars? Certainly not on the surface. You may have noticed that it's open season on Mars now. A lot of spacecraft being launched towards Mars. At the moment, Mars is only 80 million kilometers away from the Earth. And that has absolutely nothing to do with why spacecraft are going to Mars now. For example, NASA's Perseverance spacecraft is currently heading towards Mars. It is not going to travel 80 million kilometers towards the Earth. If that spacecraft traveled straight towards Mars, traveling 80 million kilometers, then by the time it has traveled that 80 million kilometers, Mars will no longer be there. That journey, travelling in that direction, is much longer. But because our spacecraft travels in the same direction that the Earth did, because our spacecraft travels in the same direction that Mars is, it actually takes a lot less fuel. And if our spacecraft can carry a lot less fuel, we can carry a lot more science. We take that route, NASA takes that route, 
the UAE take that route, Russia take that route, because it is the most fuel efficient route. And that's why it's open season on Mars. Those spacecraft take a long curving path that travels 500 million kilometers. And in nine months, our spacecraft will be on the far side of the sun. In nine months, Mars will be on the far side of the sun and they will meet up again. Currently, there are three major missions on their way to Mars. Missions from NASA, a mission from the United Arab Emirates, and then a mission from Russia. And the biggest of them is NASA's Perseverance rover. It's a craft that is very similar to the Curiosity rover. This is a robot that is about the size of a small car. It's got a mass of about of a tonne. And that raises a question. How do you get something that massive safely onto the size of Mar onto a planet like Mars? We can't use parachutes all the way down because the air is so thin, parachutes won't work. We can't use rockets because if you use rockets, then the exhaust from the rockets will blow so much debris that would damage our own robots. We can't, as some smaller robots do, use airbags and bounce down onto the surface because with a ton-sized craft, you're just going to break it. So how do we do this? What we do is we embark upon something that was colloquially known as seven minutes of terror. As a robot enters the thin and tenuous atmosphere of Mars, it uses air braking, just like spacecraft returning to the Earth. And that will slow it down. Not very much, because the air is so thin, but it will slow it down from 20,000 kilometers an hour to 2,000 kilometers an hour. Cannot land that fast, you'll be a crater. So at this point, we do use parachutes. But parachutes don't work very well in such a thin air. Well, they'll slow it down a little bit, so they slow it down from perhaps 2,000 kilometers an hour to maybe 200 kilometers an hour. And then the parachutes won't work any longer. You still cannot land at that speed. If you land at 200 kilometers an hour, you will be a pile of rubble. So then what we do is something which is quite ingenious. The rockets come down, sorry, the spacecraft comes down, and then it fires rockets, and it will hover above the ground. And when it is hovering about 20 meters above the ground, it lowers the robot on cables. So the robot touches the ground and the rocket flies away. So if the Perseverance robot is so similar to Curiosity, why is it going there? Well, Mars is very similar to the other we said, but with no atmosphere and no water that we can be aware of upon its surface. But we do know there is evidence of water. Robots like Curiosity, travelling across the surface of ancient basins, have discovered clays and gravels, rocks that can only be formed underneath water. Spacecraft like the Phoenix Lander have seen evidence of ice water settling upon the poles of Mars. And spacecraft in orbit around Mars have been able to stare through the icy surface of its poles and discover evidence of liquid water beneath those poles. There is evidence of liquid water upon the surface of Mars. Perseverance will land in an area upon Mars that is known as the Jezero Crater. The Jezero Crater is an area that we believe was flooded long, long ago. It shows evidence of vast river valleys flooding into that area and having laid down vast amounts of sediment in an ancient river delta. Perseverance will have a much more sophisticated set of tools to investigate Mars than Curiosity did. One of the things it will have is a drill that will allow it to drill below the surface and look amongst the sediment and the rocks of those ancient river deltas. Now, Mars on a nice summer's day might be minus 20 centigrade. On a cold winter's night, it could drip, dip down to minus 140 centigrade. 
it has barely any air. So the surface is bombarded by radiation from the sun. It has no magnetic field, so there's nothing to shield. If there is any life upon Mars, we are not going to find it upon the freeze-dried, radiation-baked, frozen surface. It will be below the ground, under the surface. And that is what we want to do. We want to look for life and the evidence of life in those ancient river beds. Modern robots, such as Perseverance, used in space flight, depend a lot on artificial intelligence. Because it's so far away that if it needs to ask for help, it can be half an hour before it gets a reply to saying help. So it has to make decisions on itself. And good as they are, they are not that good. It has been said that a robot investigating geology for a week is outperformed by one person with a hammer in 10 minutes. So one of the things that Perseverance is going to do is it's going to take samples with that drill and it will store the samples inside the body of the spacecraft. So those samples could be returned to Earth at a later date where we'll be able to study them in far more detail. And finally, one piece of technology that Perseverance will carry with it is in the belly of the robot. It's going to carry a little drone helicopter. Now, the air on Mars is incredibly thin, but with good engineering and very lightweight materials, it's possible to make a little helicopter that can fly, controlled by artificial intelligence, and it would be able to fly through the skies of Mars and our robot can see over the next hill. Now, there's a couple of reasons for doing this, a couple of good reasons. One is that it's a technology demonstrator to test for particular technologies that we might use on future missions. Another one is that it allows our robot to see over the next hill and plan its next move. But let's be honest, the best reason has got to be, this is so cool, if you could go flying helicopters through the skies of Mars, wouldn't you? Of all the planets in our solar system, Mars is a planet that is thought most likely to harbour life, most likely to have harboured life in the past. And over the history of science, opinion has swung from the 19th century, when people were convinced that life on Mars was an absolute certainty. We move into the 20th century, and that conviction of life upon Mars has been reduced to a B-movie fantasy. But now, opinions moving back because we've discovered life is far more tenacious than we thought. We have found life in ice core samples from the Antarctic where the temperatures are colder than those on Mars. We have found life in the rocks themselves upon the Earth. So digging for life on Mars is not unreasonable. We have found life that can survive being exposed to a vacuum, freeze-dried, warmed up again, rehydrated, and it comes back to life. We have even found life that is quite happy, staying alive, living inside the cores of nuclear reactors. So the idea of taking an environment like Mars, minus 140 centigrade, radiation, these are not problems for life as we understand it. We just need to go and look. And that tenacity of life gives us one big problem. In all of these missions that we send to Mars, biosecurity, lovely word, biosecurity is a major concern. H.G. Wells wrote in the 19th century, the War of the Worlds. And in the War of the Worlds, the alien invaders are wiped out by the microbial life upon the Earth. We are very careful when we send these spaceships to Mars and other planets and moons to make sure they are sterilised so we don't accidentally carry Earth's microbial life to Mars where we might end up being the alien invaders wiping out the environment we want to study.